think of. Uh, we are gathered here today to take uh, take on the work of Franz Fanon. Uh, within 10 days proximity to the 50th anniversary of his passing, he passed on the 12th. If this taking on is commemorative, I should like to think that rather than commemorating an end, we are here now commemorating a beginning in that richly nuanced and historicist sense that Edward Said elaborated for us in 36 years ago. Keeping in mind that since ancient times, every commemoration is a performative iteration that revivifies and sets out new lines of possibility. Accordingly, I should like to take a few moments to think about and with Fanon under the rubric of three terms, legitimacy, neo-humanism, and dignity. The Sharia, that stated, I'll start out by describing how I am oriented here in relation to these terms. I take the bearings of my attitude from a remark recently made by a well-regarded historian of the contemporary Arab world, Ahmed Jideh, who was equally well-regarded as an activist intellectual from the Phoenician Central Plateau, the revolution's epicenter, one of those euphemistically referred to as the youth of the revolution. On a hot, sunny Sunday afternoon this past June, as he and I walked the length of Avenue Habib Diba, which has become the agora of the revolution, and participating in one of its many spontaneous symposia, Jude remarked that, looking at what is happening in Tunisia now, one cannot help but ask how revolutions or revolts, uprisings and insurrections are being born, not only in the contemporary Arab and Muslim world, but also anywhere else in the world today. There is clearly an indestructible dream of a better world to which historians should apply themselves in elucidating. Then he stopped and he looked at me and said almost as an afterthought, you know, you ask me, the analysis Franz Fanon made of revolution in Africa while he was residing in Tunisia still serves as a template for understanding what is happening here now. And that whatever the outcome of the upcoming election for the Constituent Assembly, that will preserve the revolution will be whether the disparate institutions that emerged in the interstices of the state and the market, which generated the subjects of the revolution, will persevere in their anarchic dynamics. This phrase was the While this is a question of poetry, it is also a question of the types of socialities articulated with poetry. These remarks prompted me to recall Fenon's prominent role in the Algerian revolution as what I call the craftsman of intelligence. It also reminded me of the precariousness of the struggle to preserve the indestructible dream of a better world against counterforces. Fanon and Aben Ramadan lost their bid to ground the revolution in the spontaneous intelligence of the people, which I think is currently at stake in Tunisia right now, expressed in the eloquent local metaphor, Sharia Tafawa, the legitimacy of the revolution, and most definitely is what I have in mind by legitimacy. This has to do with something Fanon wrote in the field book that he kept on his journey south to Mali in 1959, which was published in 64 by Mastero as for la revolution africaine, and then of course in English in 69 as towards the African Revolution. He wrote that the greatest danger for Africa was the absence of ideology, having in mind the way in which the processes historically entailed and perhaps constitutive of the long momentum of revolutionary bourgeoisie formation beginning at the end of the 17th century and culminating the revolutions of 1848, engendered a secularization in the colonial context that rather than precipitating the decline of tribalism and religion, reinforces and extends their application. This is to recognize religion and tribalism as conceptual categories of secular modernity, and, as, and we are all well acquainted with its advent as functions of anthropology. And that work to rearticulate ways of living and thinking falling outside of the parameters of liberalism's universal history into formations well situated within that history. A more dramatic way of putting it is that the historical effect of revolution's application under imperial colonialism has been to replace old population formations with new ones in accordance with the logic of bourgeoisie formation. This transformation in nearly all modes of life into manageable forces has long been construed to be the function of politics. That same historical tendency towards hypermanagement, however, also prompts vectors of performance, of human thinking and action, that aren't quite so readily subjugated to the political. Along these lines, think for a moment of Claude McKay's banjo. This is for my good friend. A work that records a sequence of, of pointedly non-bourgeoisie performances 
enacted over a lifetime that were enabled precise, precisely by embodying almost emblematically what he called vagabondage, a well-known expression of which is his poem, Outcast. For the dim regions whence my fathers came, my spirit bonded my body longs. Words felt, but never heard, my lips would frame. My soul would sing forgotten jungle songs. I would go back to darkness and to peace, but the great western world holds me in fee, and I may never hope for a full release, while to its alien gods I bend my knee. Something in me is lost, forever lost. Some vital thing has gone out of my heart, and I must walk the way of life of ghosts among the sons of the earth, a thing apart. For I was born far from my native clime, under the white man's menace out of time. The sonnet does not exhibit a psyche-based or consumed by a sense of loss, even though it references loss, but rather one that is articulated in the perpetual effort to express what is imagined, and it can only be imagined, to be the primal inexpressible. The subject of this articulation is not in mourning, but rather is compelled by the discrepancy between what can and cannot be expressed, what can and cannot be comprehensively represented, to continually be creative. In this sense, yes, the vagabonded is poetic, but not as Benjamin understands the planeur to do to be so. That is to say, the dissolution of aesthetic distinction is not indicative of a desire for return to proper corporeal integrity in relation to things. It indicates the desire to be free among things. We can fairly designate this latter desire the blues, noting thereby that the oxymoronic figure is not melancholia, or as Curtis Mayfield states in We the People Who Are Darker Than Blue, a poem that is more plaintive than McKay's sonnet, but so too more expressly concerned with the non-reactionary force of poetic expression. We the people who are darker than blue, don't let us hang around this town and let others say what others say come true. Fanon's remark about ideology, nonetheless, can be construed as a call for criticism. Indeed, it is a call to reimagine the possibilities of secularization through recognizing the tremendous reach of its machines of desire and imagination, the success of which has hinged on the Cartesian distinction between being and ways of thinking. Speaking in Fanon's pathographic terms, this distinction is a principal factor in the etiology of modernity's seemingly pathological inability to fulfill its promise for universal rights. It is informed by the internal dynamics of a Christendom in dissolution, none of which concerns Fanon directly at all, and only conceptually as a particular historical instance of the political employment of ritualized superstition. It must be underscored, however, that his criticism is not the performance of that which seeks merely to become something else in terms of the current conceptual as well as political order of Western modernity. Rather, it seeks to compel that order to recognize the full range of forces it has engaged, not as products of that engagement, but as sets of facts and powers and practices, the material existence, historical implementation, and manipulation of which warrant tracing. Such a performance calls for something else other than ideology. A viable candidate in this context may very well simply be poetry, but poetry in relation to consciousness that is on tape the problem de la mort et de la contention, as Fanon kind of put it, which brings to fore the question of how desire functions or is articulated as an element of what might be called techniques of thinking. Alternatively, we might follow Fanon and refer to this as attitude rhythmique, in the sense of timely or eventful thinking. And as he says, the adjective should be given its full weight, for its expression as well as its source is a poetic practice that is a living style of spontaneous creation. But what can be meant by spontaneous creation except that the poetic image is a material form of imagination as the technique of living essential to thinking in the world as humans? To ask this is to ask, what defines the human for whom? And that situates us well within the ambit of the tradition of radical black thinking and imagination that we find Fanon. On this question of the human, we must draw a point of distinction between Fanon's concept and the enlightenment humanist concept of man as an abstraction. 
the lineage that so captured Adorno's meditations on the European crises, causing him to conclude that the human necessarily requires the non-human as its principle. The lineage that Sylvia Winters boldly and aptly demonstrates we have no part of, and need not do so in order to create an ethical world. Asked in this manner, the question is concerned with human beings as articulations of determinable sets of life practices and grammars. By grammars, I mean what Cyril Lenu defines as that which enables the members of a community to judge correctly, that is to say, to correctly link the discontinuities occurring in the world, bodies, objects, material, gestures, discourses, to descriptions, and to relate experience to certain of those descriptions as a feeling of fact. Even more precisely, I mean something along the lines proposed by the 8th century grammarian Sebuia, who thought of grammar as a technology of imagination in which a set of relations to things in reality and each other are articulated as constituting the world. This is a question of discovering the adequate expression. For as Banun says in the voice of Algeria, the voice of the nation, the speech act of the nation, the spoken word, orders the world as we lose it. Which is to say that with transformations of grammar, and grammars are always ultimate, always local, we cannot, or we always must encounter a transformative dissonance in basic perception, in the very world of perception, the moment de la perception, that one says. In other words, the revolutionary struggle is that of an emergent collective imagination striving to institute a concordant worldly intelligence. Turning to this question of the relationship between language, perception, and imagination as a technology of life, which is where legitimacy and neo-humanism meet, I am guided by Albert Murray's recently professed realization that all poetic expressions represent or express human feelings, how humans are constituted affectively and so what they are aware of. This means that local circumstances and predicaments and the idiomatic procedures evolved to cope with them may have worldwide implications and applications. Indeed, Murray proclaims, such is the function of fiction, which is also to say poetry, which is to say metaphor, so that whereas social science surveys are really about one place at a time, the local metaphor is about all mankind. In this relationship between fiction metaphor and thinking in the world as humans. I recall another moment with Murray when he told Don Noble, fiction's ultimate. Fiction is an attempt to order chaos. You see, Murray said, I now think in terms of particles and their waves. That's the way we conceive of entropy, which is chaos. And the one thing we have, or the only thing we can do about it, is to use that endowment that we have that Joyce was talking about when he referred to the ineluctable modality of the visible, of the audible, of the conceptual. The concept is an attempt to bring some form. Without that, you just have chaos. So you've got to have some sense of form, whether it's up, down, outside, inside, round, square, or whatever. He means here style. So everything is fiction. It's a matter of finding an adequate metaphor that would be commensurate with the complexities and possibilities of our surroundings. That's something we simply conceive, and so the whole thing is fiction. When a person talks about documentation, it means documenting concepts. What serious fiction such as poetry tries to do is to bring the deepest, the most comprehensive insights to bear upon. Speaking of documentation, what Murray calls fiction, Ibn Rushd, and before him Ibn Sina, and before him Al-Farabi, and Al-Jahad, and Al-Kindi, called this Al-Muhaq, that is, my nieces. And what he calls documentation, they call Al-Um al shiriyah by which they indicated the living community of humans articulated and sustained with poetic expression of profound, serious imagination. I could go on, and I will, because we are talking about documentation, and these resonances matter. As for fiction and form, the preeminent Arabic language Algerian novelist, Fahr Wathar, who was a young man studying at the Zaytun in the Island of Tunisia, and, and at least must have known him, and who we just lost last year to cancer. On the occasion of a seminar on the novel convened at, at the Institut du Monde Arabe at the beginning of 1988, stated his personal fundamental commitment to the principle of a dialectical form and content. 
in the sense of expanding the possibilities of getting out of the form of content, and that forms being transformed by that content, while at the same time being liberated from its transformation. That principle was behind his unwavering thought of did Ashkel of Kadima, his revolution against the established forms of the novel, which was the struggle to disengage the novel as a viable dynamic mode of representing how many of us live our lives in this world now from the necessities of historical bourgeoisie formations of life. This revolt is not only against the general form of the novel, but also against the consecration of form. It is the constant attempt at innovation of form that embodies what is purported embodies the content, like a language that is in harmony with the atmosphere. And during the process of innovative creativity in Amalit of Da'iya, the thought functions as what he calls, in the idiomatic phrase, the drafter of melodies, and not the conveyor of meanings. This is a rather complex point, and at the same time, clearly resonant with Adrian Leverkusen's remark in Mann's novel, Dr. Faustus, that the development section of the sonata form was a refuge for subjective illumination. As I said a moment ago, there are many resonances, a harmonic dissonance. And to note another, Gramsci remarks in his notebooks that the beginning of critical elaboration is consciousness of what one really is, namely to know yourself as a product of the historical process that has taken place so far and left in you an infinity of traces without the benefit of an inventory. What is needed is to initiate such an inventory. A different chord is struck if we follow Edward Said and quietly change inventory to itinerary. So now we are going somewhere, having been somewhere else. And the task is to come up with a plan of travel on the spot with no two bearing other than where we are now. And on meaning such an itinerary, Canon declares, Je demande qu'on me considère à partir de mon désir. I am not only here, ici maintenant enfermé dans la société. I allude a portion of his remark and deliberately so, perverting it, because we are precisely not in pursuit of anything other than life. Canon really does provide us with good insights without the eschatology. Now, I'm pressed on time, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to skip over the long passage about the Karamat al and the Nisaniyah, which is key to the issue of Tunisian revolution. But I will conclude in a coherent way, I should hope. <laughs> Of course, we all know the uh, couplet, Ashab Yurim, Eshat and Adam. What we don't know, and what I wanted to walk you through, is the genealogy that comes out of Hasidah written by Rashid in, in 1933. Which becomes a key phrase in Mahmoud's Hulutiyah uh, as the definition of perpetual revolution. And, and there's a key concept here that we call Garmatan and San, which is what the Tunisians claim is the name for the revolution, by the way. of Karamat in Tunis. We can talk in the question and answer period about why Arab Spring is an anathema, an insult. I want to tie this into what Fanon was trying to do in a very specific way. This notion that dignity belongs to a very particular genealogy that has worldly significance. And indeed, Shabi's will to live as a definitive element of perpetual revolution is the dignity of humanity. And the point in all this is not really to mark that there is an Arab Islamic element of the foundations of modern humanism. In fact, there is, if you remember Mandela's uh, uh, manifesto, he cites Abu Muslim as the source for his notion of humanism. The modes of conveyance of these values of dignity, however, still elude our comprehension. And, and, and this is why Tunisians today refer to what they call al akhlaq Tunisia Patria, inherent Tunisian ethics when they talk about the spontaneity with which the people of Kassarim established structures of order in all the bloody chaos during those dark days of the Rejanda, they gave chaos form. The very sense that these ethics in here necessarily in the Asian human underscores the want of an historical account of the formation of this emergent revolutionary intelligence that exposes a radical humanism. And this I take to have been the gist of Ahmed Jade's remark about an indestructible dream of a better world to which historians should apply themselves in elucidate. And I concur with him that the known sense of rhythmic attitude is crucial to such elucidation. Furthermore, to our inability to comprehend the ways in which the Tunisian revolution is the survival and victory of its values is our ignorance of Fanon's legacy of humanism. This we must remember. Je me fais, je me fais de I am the poet of the world.
And though that, I must indulge you one more time, a little bit, two minutes. Because I want to attend to a specific era of living from Abu Ahmed, who is widely recognized as the present national poet of Tunisia, and whose expressive trajectory is not to represent the Tunisian human, but humanity, and whose work is to display the role of poetry in the process of Tunisian freedom. وأنت تنظر في رماد رأيتني سوداء مثل هضائق البراء لا أقوى على تحديد فيه عن تونس يا أخي محروكة لا شعر لا عين لا أذن لي لا فحم لي وكما طار قد لا عود الأحياء وقد عود صليحة السياح لا تعطيني قلم ليقتل فإن الصابع طارت مع نار رحيب السماء التشم فعهد الشواء ماذا تقول لصاحبك ومن هما لم يفهم عن الخليف في باله فصل الشتاء عن تونس الوسطى عيش على القناة والمطر عن تونس القبرة طاب عن تونس الأخرى رماد مطقر You look into the ashes and saw me black like your shining shoes I cannot bear your stare I am Tunis my brother burnt I have no hair I have no eyes, I have no ears, I have no mouth. As you can see, I may not come back to life, and I may return clear and sharp as a cock's crow. Don't give me a pen to write with, because my fingers flew with a terrible fire across the sky. Do you smell the fragrance of barbecue? What do you tell your friends? Who are those two? Didn't they understand that winter was at autumn's door? I am central Tunis, and the Tunis of Osta. I subsist on conviction and rain. Aish al al I am greater Tunis, and the Tunis al Qubra, destiny, God. I am the other Tunis, and the Tunis al Bukhra, creative ashes. Ramadu Muntaka.